Honest, I'd like to acknowledge that we're here today on the stolen land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing resistance to colonial occupation and the ongoing violence that is used to repress that resistance. I'm going to talk today about the police, about the courts and about the carceral system. And while I think the things that I'm going to talk about are quite serious and they do deserve attention, I just want to acknowledge at the outset as well that these are not the most violent, the most vile, or the most common injustices perpetrated by those systems. I want to acknowledge that the cycles of trauma and violence that are perpetuated and driven by those systems disproportionately affect First Nations folks, other communities of colour, gender non-conforming people, and the poor. Um, Mechanisms of control are always tested on a society's most marginalised before they're generalised throughout the system. And I think it's important we remember that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm going to speak tonight from my perspective and speak to things that I've either experienced or borne direct witness to. But there is a lot to say about life in the carceral colony that I won't touch on at all because I'm not the right person to speak to you about those things. When you find the right person to speak to you about those things, listen. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge that I come to you as a humble activist standing on the shoulders of giants. I learnt everything I know about organising uh, from other organisers whose mistakes were transformed into wisdom by the act of recounting them to me. <laughs> I hope to do the same <laughs> tonight. Now, political repression, if it's done well, has many arms. There are many pillars that hold up the prevailing power structures, right? The most relevant, in my view, are the, to this issue are the police, the media, the courts, and the parliament in that order. Um, I'd like to explore, like, I'm going to use my time to basically explore how each of those sets of institutions is participating in political repression right now, and then offer some suggestions for sort of how we can counteract those effects. So, um, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to introduce you to a concept that's called strategic incapacitation. Strategic incapacitation is a set of policing practices that were developed for use against organised crime networks. Um, the aim of strategic incapacitation isn't really to arrest and charge any person in particular. It's not even really to prevent any crime in particular. It is to incapacitate the network of people undertaking the alleged crimes. So you can see where that's going already, <laughs> right? Recently, I learned that a policing and intelligence conference took place in late 2022, and it was called the National Forum on Managing Organised Disruptive Activity. How ominous is that? Uh, it was attended by law enforcement from across all jurisdictions of Australia and New Zealand. Um, but the shift that we as activists have experienced in the way that we are being policed obviously goes back way further than that. Um, Mark touched on, you know, the first person in my personal circles to be given a custodial sentence was Eric Herbert, and that happened in November 2021. The New South Wales anti-protest laws passed in April 2022, and this conference, this national forum, happened in, like, August or September of that year. So by the time the conference happened, Trump Force Guard had existed for, like, six or seven months. Um, so given that timing, it is not inconceivable to me that Strike Force Guard sort of represented an experiment in strategic incapacitation, and then the results of that experiment were communicated to the rest of law enforcement, like the broader law enforcement community at that conference. Testing it on the rat bags before you generalize it throughout the system, right? Um, in October of that same year, so like a couple months after that conference, IMARC, the International Mining and Resources Conference, came to Sydney for the first time. Previously, it had been in Melbourne, a city that has a long and proud history of disrupting that conference. I do not believe that it would have been lost on the organisers of IMARC that months earlier, New South Wales had passed some of the most repressive anti-protest legislation in the country. And then they moved it here. So... Sydney, by contrast, does not have a long and proud tradition of disrupting IMARC, so it sort of caught us off guard, and then conversations were had, and it was sort of decided that we weren't going to do anything wild, we were just going to have a straight up and down, normal rally, submit a Form 1, have the cops 
you know, approve it, whatever, because that was all anyone had capacity to throw together. Despite, so just, that is to say, no civil disobedience and no protest outside of the law was in fact being planned for this conference. However, at least 44 people across four jurisdictions were, had like interactions with police that were like under the pretense of investigating IMARC before it had happened. Um, some of those people were the same people that were arrested in the Blockade Australia protests and they were still on bail, so it provided police a reason to check on them. Some of those people had absolutely nothing to do with Blockade Australia or Blockade IMARC. Um, I had nothing to connect me to Blockade Australia from the police's perspective other than the fact that I picked someone up from Silverwater when they were released from custody in the aftermath of the Cola raid. Um, my partner, so, and then I was subsequently questioned in my home uh, about IMAR before it happened. My partner, who was driving a different vehicle that was registered in my name, that happens to be registered in my name, was pulled over on his way to work and questioned about IMARC before it had happened. Um, when we were driving to the action on the day, we were pulled over on the way in and detained in the car and questioned in the car for a while. All of that for an action that was completely lawful. No civil disobedience element to that action. This is fully consistent with the principles of strategic incapacitation. So it's not about the action, it's about the network that sustains the action. That's the only reason that you go after someone whose only connection to the alleged crime is picking someone up from the cop shop. They don't just want to know who's doing these so-called crimes, they want to know who feeds them, who houses them when they need somewhere to stay, who picks them up when they need a lift, who's rocking up with a sandwich when they get released from custody. And <clears throat> that's like basically all of the work that goes on around direct action that is integral to sustaining it, but doesn't involve doing anything unlawful yourself. And that's the, the, the thing that I really want to emphasize on this point is that, you know, previously it was like, okay, and then and this is where, you know, I, I'm agreeing with Mark that the task force is a more significant sort of development than the actual anti-protest legislation. Um, it is a meaningful shift towards authoritarianism proper if the objective of police goes from stopping activists from offending to breaking the climate movement, right? If it's about strategic incapacitation, the network is the movement in our case. So that's a different thing altogether. The last thing I want to mention before I move on from the police is the issue of bail as a mechanism of control. So anti-protest legislation is indeed a problem in its own right, and it's also an easy thing to rally around. If you've got the message like, this law is bad, we need to repeal it, that's a quick, easy thing to communicate. It's not very complicated messaging. Um, However, so to date, as Mark mentioned, uh, everyone who's been charged with the now infamous Section 144G charge that Mark was speaking about has had the charge withdrawn pretty much before they've ever made it to trial because the cops don't want to actually have it tested. They just want to scare you with it and then withdraw it. So uh, most recently, I believe that happened to Brad Homeward. Um, and his, th that charge was withdrawn like on the morning of his court appearance when he turned up. And the thing is, by that time, it had already done its job. So by that time, Brad had been on bail for over a year, subjected to bail conditions that prevented him from communicating with a list of over 30 other activists, prevented from using end-to-end -end encrypted platforms, which is where most digital organizing happens, prevented from traveling into state, etc., etc. The combined effect of those conditions took him out of organizing for more than a year. And you can only get away with imposing bail conditions that severe when you're charged with an offense that carries jail time as part of its maximum penalty. So the effect, if not the intention, of the anti-protest legislation is it has provided police with a, a quote-unquote serious charge to charge us with to justify these intense like bail conditions 
Um, and then it doesn't even actually matter whether the charge sticks in court because in the meantime it's allowed you to control that person and prevent them from participating in protests at all, even protests that are completely lawful. And if that's not being strategically incapacitated, I don't know what is. Um, then when you finally get up, then what they do is the police drag the court process out and they adjourn it and they adjourn it and they adjourn it to keep you in that on bail for as long as you possibly can be. And then you get off them finally. If you haven't been burnt off the whole thing by that experience, then you go back out, you get charged with some bullshit you didn't do and you're straight back on bail. So you, they keep us in the cycle of, of being under these, like it's, it's literally called conditional liberty. Now, to the media. <laughs> Grassroots protests, unless they are unprecedentedly large, rarely receive media coverage at all. And when we do get coverage, it's usually unfavorable, unless it's in like The Guardian or something where they're like, ooh, maybe they have a point. Oh, maybe no, oh no, no, you're right, you're right, fuck them. <laughs> um, so, there are two rhetorical devices that have been extremely successful, and I like I legit hear them come out of people's mouths word for word without the person realizing where they got it from. The first one is the conflation of inconvenience with violence. If a protest disrupts something, especially something that makes somebody a lot of money, it is spoken about as violence. So you will often see someone saying on the news, well, we respect the right to protest peacefully, but these extremists are inconveniencing everyday people. <laughs> like, so the construction is, if you are disobedient or inconvenient, you are no longer peaceful, ergo you are violent, right? And then that creates space for the police and the courts to treat us however they like, and for the parliament to legislate against us without experiencing any kind of public backlash. So it undermines any sympathy that, I, that like activists might have received from people who don't themselves protest regularly, but like care about democracy in general. The other, uh, yeah, and it, it also serves to, I think it's a deliberate attempt to divide the movement into the right kind and the wrong kind of protester, which again is undermining the network, which is the goal of strategic incapacitation. The other rhetorical device that is really, really successful is the infantilization of activists as people, right? Mm. It's a classic ad hominem strategy. If you can't attack what they say, make it about who they are. This is the second iteration of this strategy that I've witnessed in my brief organizing career. The previous one was that we were terrorists. Remember that phase? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so boring. Yeah, it's so boring. That was what they used to call us when they wanted to undermine us, and that played pretty well with some demographics, and those people will still say it, but in the general public, it didn't really catch on because it was just a bit hysterical. Like, everyone was like, calm down. Um, so they switched it up, and we went from being scary, dangerous, powerful terrorists to whinging, petulant children, right? And that does two, two important things at once. Um, the first is, like again, it's undermining that sympathy, and the second one is it diminishes protest itself from a legitimate and necessary form of politi political participation to essentially a public tantrum, right? So it takes all, it disconnects protest from power, it disconnects it from the issue that it was even speaking to, and just makes it like an annoying, like self-indulgent performance. Um, that's, uh, it transforms an active citizen into an angsty teenager, and it transforms civic participation into essentially a very elaborate role-playing game. Perhaps most importantly, it works to destroy the notion that there's a damn thing you can do about it. Now to uh, one of my all-time favorite role-playing games, which is the court. Um, the whole idea of a magistrate, right, is that they are somehow magically, inhumanly impartial. But they are human, right? They read the news, they listen to the radio, they get stuck in traffic, and they're just as susceptible as anybody else to getting caught up in a moral panic. The magistrate who initially sentenced Violet Coco to 12 months, when she was handing down her sentence, unconsciously parroted something Don Perrottet had said on TV like two days earlier, okay? And that, she wasn't quoting him, 
It just like came into her mind and out of her mouth and onto the court record. And now that's like immortalized in the court record. And finally, just to close that loop, all of those things work together in concert to open up more political space for parliamentarians to create more repressive legislation and kick off the cycle again, and we go around again. So what is to be done? I'm taking suggestions. <laughs> but don't worry, I did prepare some earlier. <laughs> so first of all, we've got to get educated. I mean, we don't have to get that education from a university or a textbook. I'm movement trained, other activists gave me these skills and I owe it to them to pass them on to other people. Um, I will train anyone who comes at me, but we need to understand the jargon, we need to understand our options, we need to know our rights, and we need to weaponize bureaucracy. When it comes to the legal system, the sad fact is education equals agency. We need to see the courtroom as just one more front on which we are fighting, not just like an annoying bureaucratic process that you fumble your way through after the action. We will never be better resourced than our opponents, so our only option is to be smarter. Not knowing about the law or not believing the law to be a legitimate source of authority doesn't mean that the law can't hurt you. Know it, learn it, understand it, teach other people, act on it. Exercise your goddamn agency. It's like a muscle. If you don't use it, it atrophies. That extends to when you're talking to your lawyer. The thing with lawyers is that they are trained to get the best outcome for their client as an individual. The movement in general is not their remit. That doesn't mean that they don't, like, as a person, want the movement to succeed. They very likely do. But the only way that they've been trained to practice law is through this very individualized lens. So go out of your way to find a lawyer that understands that distinction, but also help them understand that distinction. That's not what they're trained to do. We can't expect them to get that, like, straight away. But having said that, always remember that they work for you. They take instructions from you, and if they are not following your instructions, you should probably get the hell out of Dodge and get a new lawyer. They can give you advice, but you are in the driver's seat, so don't piss about, take the wheel. The more you have educated yourself, as I was speaking about before, the better equipped you will be to be firm with your lawyer, should you ever need to. So that's my TED Talk on agency. Now I turn to solidarity, which is, I, would, I think, the most important weapon that we have against repression. We need to stop dissing each other. Once more, for the people at the back, we need to stop dissing each other. <laughs> within, you, within any social movement, there is a spectrum of actor, actors that goes from like the most radical to sort of the most progress, like more, I'll call it progressive at that end. I am so bored of conversations about which end of that spectrum is more effective or represents a better strategy or which one's better than the other one. I would love to see us break apart this whole paradigm that those two approaches are mutually exclusive or even in tension. The progressive end of that spectrum lends a movement as a whole its legitimacy. But legitimacy on its own can be placated, undermined, diluted, and ultimately ignored. The radical end of the spectrum gives the movement as a whole its urgency. But urgency on its own can be isolated, excluded, dehumanized, and ultimately if current trends continue imprisoned. We need radicals, we need, so first of all, we need to just get over ourselves and accept that both ends of that spectrum are at their most effective in the presence of the other one. And accept that we need radicals to expand the horizons of what is possible, but we also need progressive to be implementing whatever is currently possible. Um, we are a lot better at doing that for each other when we're doing it on purpose. We do it accidentally sometimes, we manage to line up. But when we're doing it on purpose, we're way better at it. Um, when Blockade Australia got smashed by police, uh, people were literally still in custody while people were like posting hot takes about everything they'd done wrong. We gotta stop doing that, man. We gotta stop doing that. That's, that's the moment where moderate, you know, respectable voices need to come into the spotlight and go, actually, they have a point and how you're treating them is not okay.
that's that's like yeah if you legitimize the radical end of the spectrum you are by proxy legitimizing everything that is less radical than that so it's ultimately gonna like if you are in a, a organization that wouldn't have necessarily done what those people did but if you legitimize that imagine how good you look now right um, and then when we're, when we're doing that for each other consciously, we can work together to drag the Overton window over, and we, we actually kind of good cop, bad cop them, in a way, ironically, right? Like, if that, if that works on us, surely it'll work on them. So, <laughs> when people are getting smashed by repression, back them in. Even if you wouldn't have necessarily done whatever they did. <laughs> Dismantle, thank you. Dismantle the narratives that dehumanize them because the only purpose they serve is to legitimize the use of force against them. And also recognize that repression always starts at the fringes and works its way in. So if they were not out there being more radical than you, then perhaps you would be the most radical thing going and it would be you copying that repression. Mm. <laughs> Recognize also that if everyone everywhere softened their message to make it more palatable to the political center, then the most progressive thing around would be labor left. That's dystopian. If... That's awful. We need to build strategies that do not require homogeneity of tactics, of messaging, or of organizing cultures to be successful. Our power is and always has been collectively constituted. If you believe in that notion, it follows that preserving the collective and the relationships through which it is manifest is always more important than any individual action or event. No. Look. Look around you. Like, in this room. This is the team. No one is coming to save us. The power structures around us can feel that the sun is setting on their empire and we are living through the death rattles of a system that is breaking under its own weight. Even if the people at the top wanted to save us, and I don't believe that they do, they actually don't have the tools. It is us who will invent the tools to, that will solve the problems that are before us. It is us that will build the new world just like we built this one. We have never needed them. That's why they had to make us forget everything that we're capable of. They had to invent permission just to have something to give us. Thank you. Yeah.